I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. Well, the elections are just about wrapped up. A bunch more numbers were reported late today, giving us some clarity on the races that were still kind of hanging up in the air. Let's get right to Evan Watson, who has the latest on all that. Evan? Yeah, Pat, I've got some breaking news for you. The Oregonian has just projected that Democrat Andrea Salinas will win Oregon's 6th Congressional District over Republican Mike Erickson. This is big news just in tonight in the last minute or two. Salinas extended her lead tonight to about 6,000 votes when Washington County and Marion County added about 19,000 votes combined to these election results. Salinas gaining ground here tonight. Washington County still has more votes to add tomorrow. Marion, Polk and Yamhill have votes to add too. But all that said, this is now a projected winner of a race. Andrea Salinas wins the newly created 6th district which means that the Democrat Democrats pick up that seat in the House of Representatives. Now, a couple other races to recap, just so you're all caught up. In Oregon's 5th Congressional District, Republican Lori Chavez Dreamer beat Democrat Jamie McLeod Skinner. The Associated Press called the race this weekend, and McLeod Skinner conceded yesterday. Chavez Dreamer's win flips this district from blue to red, and in a statement, she said she promises to approach every issue through a nonpartisan lens. And over in Washington, Democrat Marie Glusenkamp Perez has beaten out Republican Joe Kent, according to the AP. Glusenkamp Perez won more than 55% of the votes in Clark County, the largest county in that district. That's four points better than the results for Democratic Senator Patty Murray in this election, suggesting that Glusenkamp Perez earned the votes of some moderates and some Republican voters. So we now have all of those races decided with projected winners at this point. Salinas, the projected winner in Oregon's 6th District, big update there, Pat. And as that last dump of numbers came in, talk us through a little bit, Evan, will you, on how that works for her and against uh, Erickson? Sure, sure thing. So Washington County favors Salinas and she gained about two and a half thousand votes there tonight. And then on the other side, Marion County favors Erickson and Erickson gained about a thousand. So net that's a thousand and a half towards Salinas. And then when you look forward to what's left, there's about 8,000 from Washington County, about 16,000 or so from some of the other counties that favor Erickson, but not by much. And having a 6,000 vote lead at this point means that likely with the Oregonian and then maybe other outlets moving forward are going to call her a projected winner in this race. Wow. All right. Thanks for breaking it right here on the story, Evan. Appreciate it. And now for a chance to say I was wrong. My wife would say, say you're wrong again. Back in mid-October, Evan and I were right here in the studio talking about Marie Glusenkamp Perez on the air and her chances against Joe Kent, the Republican. I said something to the effect of she had little, if any, chance to win. Why? Well, first, she's a Democrat, and the third district in Washington has been Republican since 2010. And she has no political experience, and she only got 31% of the vote in the primary. And because national groups like 538 rated her chances of winning as 2 in 100, and because that third district is conservative, although apparently not that conservative. The majority of voters now have rejected hard right candidate, former Special Forces military veteran Joe Kent, and went for Glusenkamp Perez instead. She's a moderate, gun owning Democrat. The Seattle Times called her victory the most stunning upset in the country this year. And I was wrong. Congrat congratulations to Marie Glusenkamp Perez and everyone else who voted for her. Now, Let's move to the Portland City Council race, which saw incumbent Joanne Hardesty lose to challenger Renee Gonzalez. A team from the Oregonian studied the race and found something super interesting. Both the rich on Portland's west side and the poor living on the east side of the city voted for the challenger, Gonzalez. Take a look at the map the Oregonian created based on vote counts. Hardesty's votes are pink there in the middle. Gonzalez are green on the left and the right side of the screen. Now, they each got votes from every part of the city, but this shows the parts of Portland where each won. The darker the color, the bigger their margin of victory. To help break this down, I talked with the Oregonian City Hall reporter Shane Dixon Cavanaugh. He dug into it for the paper. And by the way, if you've not read his story, you should look it up. It's super interesting. Here's part of our discussion about the rich and the poor voting together. Gonzalez was able to run up substantially high margins east of 205 and also west of the Willamette River. In both those parts of the city, Renee won uh, votes at, or outperformed uh, Commissioner Hardesty almost two to one. So almost 66 to 33 on both the you know, far east portion of Portland and on the west side. Meanwhile, 
Okay. Can I interrupt you there? Because I, I think that that's fascinating. You wouldn't think those two groups, or I wouldn't, would vote together. One's the more affluent, the other's kind of the um, not as affluent and working class. Well, this is actually sort of an interesting thing that we've seen play out in Portland previously, but also in other parts of the country as well, in major American cities where there have been coalitions that have helped elect more sort of centrist or moderate Democrats in big American cities. Now, when he says coalition, he's talking about an informal coalition. I don't think there's been any meetings between the two sides saying, hey, let's unite and go for a Gonzalez. But really, they didn't need to be. Those two groups are fed up over the same issues, crime and problems generated by homeless campers. Well, what I would say is that First of all, what you just said is correct. I mean, this was an election that centered around two issues in particular in Portland, homelessness, which you mentioned, and also crime, both in terms of record levels of shootings and homicides in the city, but also a whole host of uh, lower level property crimes and livability crimes uh, that have you, you really have grown in, uh, in, in size and scale as well, whether we're talking about St you know, stolen cars, stolen catalytic converters, and other sort of low-level crimes. And in, in both those cases, yeah, East Portland has been disproportionately impacted uh, in terms of crime in the city, but also, uh, it, also in terms of sort of unsanctioned camping we've seen. So on the east side, lower income folks have had to live with the day-to-day impacts of crime, things like getting their car stolen and gun violence and more. And they, along with voters on the west side, and also many in the city's inner neighborhoods, are all saying, enough, time for a new direction. One of the things that we have thought about in our newsroom uh, in terms of sort of looking at this election overall, I mean, clearly with this particular race, the contrast between the two candidates uh, both in terms of their policies, their professional backgrounds, where they live in the city, you know, could not be more stark or different. But also, Portlanders right now are very unhappy with city hall and local government. I mean, a uh, high, high, high level of dissatisfaction. And he says they took that out on Hardesty, who was the only person up for election from the Portland City Council. Although... You could also argue that voters sent that same message when they decided to change Portland's form of government, essentially throwing all the elected officials out in two years. Now, throughout this election season, we've heard concerns from some of you about election security and how long it takes to count the ballots, for example. We talked about it today with Oregon Secretary of State Shamia Fagan, who's in charge of the elections. She says the time it takes to count ballots actually is a good thing for election security in Oregon. This is just the process working itself out. Just as an example, one of the biggest bottlenecks in elections processing is signature verification. So because we vote at home, it's that signature signed under penalty of perjury. Somebody saying, I'm the person who is the registered voter on this envelope, right? That's a process that every single signature out of the millions and millions of ballots that are sent in in Oregon every election cycle, every single envelope, there's a barcode on that envelope and it's scanned. And then on the computer comes up that person's voter registration file and most importantly, their voter registration signature. And that is then checked with the signature on that ballot envelope. Again, every single one is checked. And so it's our security measures actually make it take a while to do that processing. You know, it would be a lot quicker to get on an airplane if I could just park my car and walk right on the plane. But there's TSA does its job and there's security measures that are put in place. So we also wanted to know how things are going in Clackamas County. Remember that? They were the ones counting ballots through the weeks after the May primary because of blurry barcodes that were sent out. Well, Secretary Fagan says her office was on that. They checked on Clackamas County ahead of time. Coming into November, we wanted to make sure that we knew people were concerned about Clackamas. And so I directed my elections division director to be personally on hand when Clackamas conducted their pre-election machine audit. Just so folks know, we audit the machines before ballots with what are called test decks. So it's decks of ballots 
that are just testing to make sure the tabulator is working and, and recording votes accurately. And then, of course, we do a post-election audit with the real ballots. And so all 36 counties conducts pre-election audits. They're called logic and accuracy tests. Uh, they're open to the public to come and view. There's schedules at your county clerk's offices of when you can view those. But I did direct my elections division directors to be personally on hand to view Clackamas to make sure that they tested all of the ballots from all the different sources in their test deck. And they did. So I was confident that that Clackamas was not going to have any, you know, massive ballot printing errors this time around. And honestly, the fact that they've been a little bit slower than other counties this time is just normal election administration. Again, signature verification it takes time to make sure that that all these conspiracy theories about people stuffing ballot boxes and all these crazy conspiracy theories that come out of the big lie, that we know those aren't real because every single signature is checked on every ballot in Oregon, and that takes time. And I'm fine because what's most important is that we get it right, not that we get it fast. I have to say, I checked the uh, security procedures at both Washington County and Multnomah County. I was very impressed with how thorough they are. So she's saying uh, things that ring true there. What about you, though? Do you still have questions about the election, election security, or maybe even the ballot counting process? We'd like to hear them. Send them to us here at thestory at kgw.com. That's our email address, thestory at kgw.com. We also want to know what you're wondering about when it comes to Measure 114. That's the gun safety measure that passed in Oregon. It bans high capacity magazines. And once it takes effect in Oregon, there will be several new rules to follow when you buy a gun. For example, you'll have to get a permit. You'll have to go through safety training. You'll have to get a background check and pay a fee. So far, several sheriffs across Oregon have said they are not going to enforce this new measure. And by the way, it is likely that someone is going to file a court challenge to block the new law before it ever goes into effect. And that'll delay it at least for a while. But in the meantime, you have questions, we want to hear them because we want to find answers. Send them to us. Again, the email is thestory at kgw.com. We're putting together a big old list and we're going to get as many of your questions answered as possible. And now to our homeless crisis. New data is being released on the number of people living on our streets. Back in January, the county and city did their point in time count where they count how many people are living homeless on a given night. This year's count back then found more than 5,000 people in Portland and Multnomah County. Well, fast forward, the full report has just come out 11 months later. It shows the number of chronically homeless people, a subset of that bigger number, is growing. And it's growing despite the city and county opening new shelters and taxpayers spending hundreds of millions of dollars. Blair Best reports. It's been really, really hard. Year after year, I just turned 60 on Halloween. Stuck in a cycle with no clear way out. And every time you try to get forward, something will come and just snag you right back, you know, because we've been trying to be just about there. We're just about out and, you know, it sucked us back in. This section of Northeast 33rd Drive, now the closest thing to home for Shelby Ryan. I think it was. She became homeless. This is Miss Molly. <laughs> after her husband passed away. Hi, Miss Molly. You lose everything because you can't think. Then you end up here. Yeah. Her story isn't unique. Ryan is one of the more than 3,000 chronically homeless people in Portland. Being chronically homeless means living on the streets with a disability for more than a year. That's why we've kept expanding. It's why we've refined our shelter models. The county's Joint Office of Homeless Services works to get people like Ryan off the streets. Last year, it helped more than 4,000 people leave homelessness. Yet the problem keeps getting worse. In 2015, 20% of people in shelter were chronically homeless. This year, that grew to 65%. And that's not including those living outside. In a world where you can literally help 4,560 people end their homelessness and you still see what we see, it goes to show that there, is, there are other forces at play here, and it's, it's really challenging. Half their budget now goes toward expanding and operating shelters. They've opened motels, safe rest villages, and congregate shelters, all of which are out of the question for many. But I mean, if you're going to make us go to a prison or these teeny tiny little homes that is like the, not even the size of my back and my pickup truck, it, it, it's not going to work. These people are going to, they're just not, they're, it's not going to follow up. Which is one of the reasons they're still here year after year. The people come down and they want to help you in different agencies and resources. And they really, really, really do it. And we thank them so much. 
But then when it comes down to it, they come by one time, talk to us, and never come back. Some of the things are just really backwards. I just don't get it out here. I mean, sometimes I just want to just like, just walk out the door and just walk away from it all and just let it all go, you know? The Point in Time report goes on to say that ending homelessness will come from focusing on the factors that push people onto the streets in the first place. That's things like rising rents, not enough income, racial injustice, and physical and behavioral health problems. Blair Best, KGW News. The weather's been beautiful for the past week. No rain, lots of sunshine, not a drop in the forecast for days to come. Seems great, right? Unless you're worried about the climate changing. And if you do, you're not alone. And now, we want to hear from you. The details, when the story returns. News about climate is not always that fun to consume, and the current state of things is not that great. The future really doesn't look that much better. So researchers have started to study the kinds of feelings that climate change can conjure up. They even have a name for it, climate anxiety. Environmental reporter Cale Williams is here now to talk about climate change and mental health, where they converge, and by the way, there's something that you can do to help researchers, right Cale? That's right. I mean, climate change can be a depressing thing to think about. It's a problem we've known about for decades, and it often feels like the progress we're making is, you know, stop and go at best. So researchers from the University of Bath, that's in the UK, they surveyed some 10,000 young people from 10 different countries and found that 60% of them were very worried about the climate crisis. And these young people used words like anxious, angry, powerless to describe how they felt. Okay, but does the same hold true in Oregon? It does. Uh, earlier this year, the Oregon Health Authority released a report that had similar findings. Our young people said they felt desperation, frustration, hopelessness when confronted with the state of the climate. Local youth climate activist Cassie Wilson, interviewed here at a climate protest in Portland earlier this year, said the 2020 wildfires were a galvanizing moment for her. The entirety of the county was under some level of evacuation order and it was terrifying and ever since then we've only seen more and more and more impacts from climate change already happening on a local level. 
You know, and this isn't something that I'm immune to either. As an environmental reporter, I've probably taken more climate news than most people. It's easy to find myself in a pretty dark place sometimes. And I say that as a white guy who makes a decent living. So I'm relatively insulated from the everyday impacts of climate change. So it sounds like climate anxiety doesn't fall evenly across the board, right? There are some folks that are suffering more than others. Yeah, I mean, research is really still in the early stages, but preliminary studies have found that climate anxiety is much more acute for younger people, low-income folks, and people of color. And it makes sense when you think about it. You know, all of those groups are more likely to be on the front lines as climate change causes more intense wildfires, droughts, and heat waves. You know, just for an example here, most of the people that died when we had the heat dome were low income, and a lot of them didn't have working air conditioners. Uh, but there is good news. We don't have to just wallow in this. People can take action, right? And you want to hear from our viewers. That's right. You know, those of you who watch the story regularly, you know that we love hearing your feedback, and this is no different. We've got a post up right now at kgw.com with a short survey on how you're feeling about climate change. We want to know whether climate anxiety is impacting you on a daily basis, and if so, how. We want to know if it's affecting the choices you're making about the future, whether that's what kind of car to buy or whether to start a family. We also want to know, you know, among all the bad news, what gives you hope? And the whole survey only takes a couple minutes to complete, and your answers will help inform the future of our reporting. There's even a spot to leave your contact info so I can follow up and ask you more questions. And if you're up for it, I might even include you in a story down the line. Well, wow, that sounds great. And I said it was good news because it's one thing to just sit there and kind of wallow in all this. But if we can take a little bit of action, that helps. You know, it really helps to have a sense of agency in this type of thing. You know, one of the things that gets me down is when I feel like there's nothing that I can do. Even if you're answering a survey, you're helping us to inform our reporting, and that's going to make for better future stories down the road. Absolutely. Thank you, Kale. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It. We know housing prices have gone up, but how much do you really need to be earning to buy a house in the Portland area? Well, it turns out it's about six figures. Oh, God. Yep, that's about right. That and other stories you might have missed from the past few days when we come back. It's like starting out the season early. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, first first day of the season and it's just awesome. It's amazing. We've been waiting for this the whole summer. Honestly, we couldn't miss it. Today we took day off. <laughs> um, I'm hoping for a lot of really good skiing. It was an exciting day on the mountain for skiers and snowboarders, but the joy was short-lived. 
Timberline opened for the season on Friday and then closed back down on Sunday. It was a limited opening, only two lifts going, but by the end of the weekend, there just wasn't enough snow to last, and they had to shut down again until there's more. It's no secret the housing market has changed within the last five years alone, and boy, will it cost you a pretty penny for a new home. Oh, God. Yep, that's about right. The Portland Business Journal took home values from Zillow and came up with the minimal annual income needed to buy a house within the Portland metro area. And you basically need a six-figure salary. It takes $135,000 to get into a Beaverton home, $212,000 for Northwest Portland, $107,000 for Southeast, $167,000 for Southwest, and the spending part of the metro is still Lake Oswego, where the median income level is $237,000. It's very demoralizing when you are 40 years old and you're losing this independence and you know that's the future and what's going to happen. And that's why nonprofit Parkinson's Resources partnered with local designers to create accessible designs for people with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. Why can't we have stuff that works for everyone? Maria Viano Edwards with the University of Oregon Sports Design Master's Program is one of the designers. Amy modeled Maria's design at Pattern for Parkinson's, an adaptive fashion show that showcased shoes, clothing, and accessories for people with movement disorders. By allowing yourself to have the ability to put something on easily, to put on beautiful lipsticks and fun earrings, you can escape that reality of Parkinson's and you can be yourself. Looks like fun. And if you missed any of our big stories here on The Story, don't worry, you can get caught up. It's really easy. Use this QR code to sign up for our email newsletter. Hold your phone's camera here and follow the link to the sign up. It's free and every Monday it comes to your email and includes some of our biggest stories from the past week. All righty, keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. We're going to wrap things up right after this.
The KGW Great Toy Drive is here. If you want to donate, you can. Just use the camera on your phone right now and scan the QR code that's there on your screen. It'll take you to a list of toys that you can send straight to KGW. Also, this is the week of giving. In that spirit, internet provider Ziply Fiber is donating $5 for each new installation it makes. You can also drop off a new unwrapped toy at any IQ Credit Union, Fred Meyer, or local Toyota dealership. Help bring a little joy to local kids this holiday season. Hey, that's the end of our show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining me. But remember, the story, our story, well, that never ends.